maven, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. Wow. How, where do we begin? I'll bring in my uh, associate, Mr. Wayne Viner, in with me this morning. Wayne, it was quite a day yesterday and not a good one. Quite a day, and it went into the night as um, a scandal on the college basketball scene comes to light. And a bit shocking, we've got another investigation. Now, this is different than the investigation uh, from the FBI perspective that we talked about. Uh, weeks ago, where Louisville and other programs were rumored to have paid players to go to school. This is now an agent scandal. Yeah, I hear an agent scandal. Here's the thing that you and me care most about, and that's the involvement of the University of Maryland. And it's pretty clear that uh, the movement to get Diamond Stone to come to Maryland and his one year of just strange season wow what a mistake that was Wayne and then it turns out that he took fourteen thousand dollars and I guess the only saving grace is that they really execute what should happen you know Maryland won't lose any championships or anything they'll have a vacated season of where they made the sweet 16 but much more than Maryland this is you know, and it's pretty clear that Turgeon knew nothing about it. I put out a statement yesterday saying, you know, he had no knowledge, and I firmly, 1,000%, am in his corner. Unfortunately, that doesn't excuse the fact that you had a professional playing. If a man was getting paid, you know, whether you knew about it or not, look at Reggie Bush. You know, but Jay Billis was unbelievable yesterday, Wayne. I don't know if you got a chance to hear him. He said, are we shocked? Danny told me he had pictures of people with their heads in the sand. All right. And, you know, let's go current, though, because current is the issue right now. Miles Bridges. And now yesterday, Sean Miller was wiretapped to have been talking about a $100,000 payment. I mean, are these teams, I mean, are these players going to be immediately suspended from the tournament, Wayne? There's no guidance yet on what's going to happen. Wendell Carter from Duke? Duke? Go ahead, Wayne. Well, well, we're talking about what the agents did. And the agents got involved with the players, either loaned them or paid them. Some of these players that you listed were paid in kind. So we're talking about people who might have gotten free meals, maybe car leases, maybe cash. And it had nothing to do at this level with the actual institution. We're talking about a sports agency here. They got players to accept money. So this is a different level of scandal. So, yes, Does this come under the control of institutional control, though? I don't know if you can put it under institutional control because these are individual players talking to an agent. Now, when you talk about a, a lack of institutional control, has been where it's been the school who made the illegal overture. Now, there's, because this is college basketball, we're talking about rules that the NCAA made. So when a player takes money from an agent, that's not illegal in a legal sense of the word. It's a violation for the NCAA because it makes the player now paid, and that makes them, as you said, a professional player, and the NCAA is supposed to be an amateur league. What the FBI investigation when you talk about paying a player $100,000 to have them make the decision to go to school, well, that is an illegal act. So th- th- this is a more of a gray area. So when somebody says, are you surprised that some of these players took money 
from somebody not related to the school, well, that's not illegal. It's just against NCAA regulations. So it's a different level of, of wrongdoing here. So maybe you're going to get in trouble because you had a player who was ineligible, whether you knew it or not. But when you say it's Duke, it's Kentucky, it's everybody, it's Maryland, there's players from all of these schools that took money from agents. That's not a, really a lack of institutional control at a college level. It might be a lack of control at the NCAA level, and it brings to light whether or not the NCAA is even worth having a, around because the NCAA didn't find any of this out. This was all reported because of an FBI investigation. How about the kid from Arizona, this guy, Aiton? 18 double-doubles, 19 points a game, and there's a possibility he was, uh, you know, it just goes on and on. You got, uh, what's the name, the kid from Alabama, it, it, these are your lottery picks are all involved. This is a scandal of and here's the sad part about it, Wayne, and I was talking with Danny about it before the show, and you and me talked about it. This is all the fault of the NCAA for not stipending or paying players in the top five conferences or the top teams anything to play basketball. And please, talk to me, don't talk to me about their getting an education. If a kid goes to school for one year with the purpose, sole purpose of going to the NBA, college is just a professional vehicle. The coach is making two and a half million dollars. The assistant coaches are making eight, uh, eight hundred thousand or whatever. The NCAA is getting paid what a billion and a half to televise the games. And the kids get to eat meals in the dorm, and so many of the kids come to college without any kind of financial backing from their parents or whatever, and they're supposed to live the normal college lifestyle with no additional money? Where's this fault really lie? I've been saying it for, I've been really. saying it for years, Wayne. I've been saying it for years, and people say so always throw up, they're getting a college education. College education is great. And yeah, maybe some of the kids come to Varum Ram came to school to get a college education. But did Diamond Stone? Did Robert Carter Jr.? You know? And uh, can we name every one and done at Kentucky? How many have there been? There's a lot of them, Bruce. And you are correct that the top, top players, I don't think fit into the mold of what the NCAA allegedly wants. So you have to look at if this system works. The obvious answer is no, it really doesn't work at the top level. The reason why starts with enforcement. If you want to look at the building blocks here, you like soccer in Europe. Soccer in Europe, these countries have an overall association that takes you from the youth league through the pro league. We don't have that here. What we have here is that high schools are run in one men, uh, venue. The summer leagues with all of the agents and, and all of that, AAU, run by a different organization. The NCAA allegedly runs college basketball, and then the NBA takes care of the pros. So if you have a violation at the NCAA level, let's say these young men are all declared ineligible. Is that going to affect anything for their future? And unless they actually broke the law, the answer is usually no. It no, it's not. I mean, they'll go, look, they'll all leave school. They'll all enter the draft, and the ones good enough will be drafted. Sure. And, the, and the ones That's that aren't it. good enough will go play in the G League or go to Europe, and the ones that are really bad, you'll have to look for a job. Right. So maybe the answer, although all of these organizations, FIBA, FIFA, the Olympics, the, the American gymnasts, all of these end up being corrupt at some level, so it seems. But until an NCAA, or uh, stop using that phrase, a college infraction actually affects your livelihood down the road, you're right. They're going to get thrown out of school. 
and they just go on. If you had a single body that adjudicated these, that if a problem you had in college actually affects where you end up as a pro, maybe some of this has some teeth for the players. But right now it doesn't. They break a rule at the NCAA level, and three or four years later, the NCAA comes in and says, well, we're going to vacate that season. This doesn't affect Diamond Stone at all. It just affects the institution where he was three years ago. And in some cases, by the time the NCAA gets around to doing anything, the coach is gone, the assistants are gone, and all the players are gone. And all it affects is the university, and that apparently is not enough to stop anybody from any wrongdoing. Wayne, here's a list of the players that are currently playing top-level basketball. You got Alabama, Colin Sexton, Duke, Wendell Carter, Kev, uh, Kentucky, Kevin Knox, Michigan State, Miles Bridges probably was going to be the uh, MVP in the Big Ten. South Carolina, Brian Bowen, that's our name has already come up. Texas, Eric Davis Jr., and USC, Benny Boatwright. We're talking about all, well, not all lottery picks, but probably all first-round picks. And are these guys going to be suspended right away and miss the tournament? Billion-dollar tournament? There's a lot going on here, and uh, uh, finally, it's hit the fan. And the one thing that comforts me, and I know it comforts you, is that we know Mark Turgeon pretty well. And Mark Turgeon... The level of Diamond Stone taking money is where it's going to end for Maryland. And I, I, I'm going to say the same thing about Coach K. I cannot imagine Coach K ever paying anybody to come to his school when, he, when everybody lines up to go there. But some of these other situations, I wouldn't say it about Kentucky, and now we know we can't say it, about Sean Miller in Arizona. Hey, I like Sean Miller. Yeah, well, maybe Kevin been, Anderson was right. You have been saying for a while that you don't think he's on the up and up. Well, he doesn't seem to be on the up and up, does he? Up and up. <laughs> Look at the team. You got that trio using uh, uh, performance enhancing <laughs> drugs again. And you got the center who might have gotten a hundred thousand dollars to go there. You got two coaches, assistant coaches that were released. And Coach Sean Miller knows nothing about it. Bruce, you know? they don't know anything about it. Uh, nobody, never, whoever gets caught in this and says, "Oh, I did it." Nobody. That's not the way this game is played. These guys are playing for teeth. They're when you mention these top programs that are in trouble, I think most of them fall under the, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. So are you really surprised at this point that some of these players got paid? Are you surprised that all it takes to get an absolute five-star NBA lock is $100,000? I don't know, but, you know, they're talking about current stars. Dennis Smith Jr., the phenomenal point guard for Dallas received a five-figure payment before his top, before he started at NC State. Isaiah Whitehead, another good point guard for Brooklyn, he received a five-figure payment while at Seton Hall. He was the most high-profile recruit to have signed with Coach Kevin Willard at the school. Uh, you remember when I Mark L. Fultz. <laughs> They, they all. You remember when we first started, and uh, you'd read the line on the NFL or, or one of these college games, and I'd go, wow, that seems like a lock. I like a lot of, of points going one or the other. And you said, these Vegas guys know what they're doing. If, the, if there's a big point spread, they know something you don't. Well, I would like to take a look at these agents' books and see if their predictions are right. Because these guys are, in effect, gambling on these players. They're taking players before they play in college in some cases and writing them a check for twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars 
in hopes that these players are going to be first-round draft picks, and they're going to make a lot of money off of this because that's going to be their agent. They got something on them. They gave them money. It just it's came broken. across. It just came across ESPN. I didn't. I saw it belatedly. Already, three players are being withheld. Three of the top names, and it was so quick I didn't notice who it was. I think I saw Malik Pope. Isn't he? He's a Kentucky guy. Uh it's already started. The question is: Is Miles Bridges going to play? That's a that's a big one. Is Wendell well, Carter going to play for Duke? Uh, on the case of Bridges, which is Michigan State's phenomenal ball player, it was rumored or reported that he took money for meals, but I'm not sure that he actually was one who took a loan. Now, with what everything else, boy, talk about somebody who's busy. The Michigan State Athletic Department and legal team uh, must be one of the busiest ones in the history of college with the scandal they had over the sex abuse problems just weeks ago. And now their top basketball player is rumored to have been involved taking payment in kind from an agent is this is more of, this is a a good one for science and Kirk. We should bring them on for NCA talk because everything we talk about is a legal problem now. It certainly seems that way. And, uh, yeah, you know, I'm. Uh, it certainly, certainly was. Uh, I don't know how to put it. Surreal yesterday. All right, when I started to get texts, you hit me at seven thirty in the morning. I didn't even look at my email. Then around nine o'clock, I started getting texts and this and that and what's going on. As if we know. Uh, it's just. Uh, wonder how that affects the crowd today at College Park. Big game for Maryland against Michigan. It's certainly, uh, well, and they said that, I read today that uh, uh, Turger will take questions after the game. <laughs> he was supposed to take questions yesterday, but due to all this turmoil. Well, they didn't know what to say. I mean, at this point, they didn't know what to do. But look, Mark Turgeon would never offer somebody money to go to Maryland. He's too up and up. And what happened with Diamond Stone happened. And what? I mean, Diamond Stone, I mean, it's like ridiculous. You know? I, a guy is nowhere. And he's he, he's a guy who gives Maryland the, uh, the name. The bad name. But, uh... Yeah, so originally when the story came out, it was really focused that Maryland paid Diamond Stone. Which was not the truth. Knowledge, Maryland did not, and I've been on a war path now for 26 hours or something. Maryland didn't pay him. An agent paid him. It, Maryland had, at, at this point, for what we know and what we think, Maryland had Zippo, nothing, not a to do with this. But Maryland does have something to do with what's going on later today. At 12 o'clock, it is senior day. And uh, Maryland takes on Michigan, and now the game has a little bit less significance with all these rumors swirling. But number 17, Michigan, comes to Xfinity Center. And you told me days ago this is going to be a pick em game. I'm looking at the line. The line is a pick em line. Number 17, Michigan, comes in, in the last couple of minutes that we have here, or a minute or so. What do you expect crowd wise and what do you expect in the last game for Checo and Nick and, and Sean Obie's last game? It's Saturday afternoon at noon. All right, the best time for a basketball game. Maybe two o'clock's better, but Saturday at noon, high noon, the crowd's gonna be in a fever pitch. Maryland will get their top twenty victory. I had a long talk with uh Patrick Stevens yesterday and he said that he believes that with the Michigan win, Maryland, he thinks they're still going to have to get to the finals to, uh, to, to, get, to have a good chance to get a bid. He said, unless it fell in place, and maybe they could beat Michigan State and Purdue. <laughs> and now without Miles Bridges, they might have a chance, you know? They might, yes. Yeah. I think that Michigan, with Maryland's new lineup with more solid playing the power forward position, and having Fernando 
or Checo on the court against Wagner, who I think is the Michigan he's the guy. Center is, he's the guy. He's the guy. But they're not overly big, strong. They don't look like the rest of the Big Ten. They look a little more like Maryland. So I think this lineup can work. It worked well enough. Was it only uh, four or five weeks ago when we went to Michigan and had them beat? The game got away at the end. I actually, I'm, I'm well, going to agree with you. You said Maryland's going to probably could beat these guys. I think Maryland's going to beat them today. They're going to beat them. I mean, they had they had them beat in Michigan. You know, we're, we won't go into the final play because that's been beat to death. But uh, they had him beat at Michigan. We'll see how it goes. Wayne, we're out of time. I'll see you in a couple hours. I assume you'll get there early today. And, uh, I'm going to be there early. It's a whiteout. If you feel like doing something today, come out to Xfinity Center. You get a free T-shirt today. It is a whiteout against number 17, Michigan. Hey, here's the bottom line, all right? Tory's there today. Super Bowl oh, right. champion. You know? Sure, maybe he'll make a reappearance on uh, the post game, but it'll be interesting today on the post game. I'm not sure what we're going to come up with, Wayne, but that's your that's your responsibility. All right, I'll find I'll find somebody to pop on there, and you can see that later today on TerpTalk.com. Great interview with Mellow Tremble, by the way. Super interview right. with Mellow Tremble last week when I was away. Uh, good job by you and Mason on that one. All right. With that, we're going to head out to our first break. Wayne, thanks a lot for coming on. This is thanks Bruce Posner. You're, you're listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. And my producer's been silent, which is like impossible for him. Back in a few minutes here on 1300 AM. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, Sports Maven. All right, back here on segment two of Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. And uh, Danny, I have one question to ask that, you know, kind of irrelevant to what's going on. But how does Manchester City lose to Wigan Athletic? How does that happen? You know, there seems to be a few of those every year where the uh, the top team or a top flight team loses to a uh, lower Manchester division Manchester City, I know. He, they've been having a legendary season. But, uh, you know, when they drew against uh, Liverpool a couple weeks ago, and, I mean, it, every team goes through a lull in the season. I think you and I were talking at some point in December how right around this time of year they will come back to earth a little bit, but I'm pretty sure they're still like 15, 18 points oh, clear, it's, so it, it's, it's, it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. They've won. Uh, deservedly so. You know, it's one thing I like about Premier League. What happens in the beginning of the year is as or more important than what happens at the end of the year. Yes. All right? Every game is crucial. You have 38 games that matter, unlike... You know, all the playoffs in uh, the United States, which, you know, certainly is good for the fans. Yeah. With two two minutes to go in the first half, I don't know if you heard about this. Delaware led Drexel 53-19. to Did you hear about that? No. Final score, Drexel 85, Delaware 83. Wow, that's almost as bad as... 34 point. Deficit. See, I thought Northwestern uh, beating up 27. on Mid-Bags 27 against Michigan State last weekend. I thought that was big. Wow. Unbelievable. All right, I got to talk about this because it's been bothering me all week. And I want to get, uh, just want to let it out. Yeah. The Cleveland Browns have offered Kirk Cousins six year deal, $198 million, and $97 million guaranteed. And yet the Jets still want to give him more. Well, the Jets right now are five years, 150. Are they up in the ante? I don't know. Well, I think the Jets are actually offering more guaranteed money. I'm pretty sure the Jets are offering almost over 100 million guaranteed. I mean, that that's the well, that's that changed. The right they now. were offering them 90, but that okay. was three days ago. Who okay. knows what happens? You might be right. No, all the offers are in the 90s. First of all, when you make this, it doesn't matter where you go. If I was Kirk Cousins, I'd go to the team that's got the best chance to win. But he doesn't seem to think in that regard. For some reason, he seems to be, I guess he feels if he goes to New York. But let me ask you something. What do you need endorsements for when you're making $29 million a year? Yeah. What's what's endorsements? Well, and and that's why I feel like if you're going to take that sort of guaranteed money, I mean, it it will pay to go to a small market. Because, again, you're not sacrificing endorsement money. That's why I feel like... 
if, for, if he's really caring about maximizing his value, both in terms of his contract with his team and endorsements, I don't see why he wouldn't go to the Jets. It seems like really it's just become a bidding war. And I mean, we see it here in, in Baltimore, Bruce, with, with Joe Flacco. I mean, if you sign a, a quarterback to that sort of contract, what sort of constraints does he, do you have to build a team around him, especially if you're already a subpar team like the Jets or like the Browns? I mean, the Browns are on an even lower level than the Jets. I, I'm not sure exactly what that means for the rest of his career and how he could be viewed as a success. And I feel like maybe he sees that. That's my logic. I feel like he knows that he's going to get the biggest quarterback contract of any free agent quarterback in this class. If it was me... If it was me, I'd go to Jacksonville because that's a team that's ready to win a title. And right? I think that makes total sense. And with a great defense, I mean, they almost got there with Blake Bortles. Mm -hmm. All right, You go to Jacksonville, they're on the verge of winning a, t a title. Great running backs, you know, or possibly you go to the Vikings. Right. All right. But you would have to take significantly less money for that. And I feel like if he knows that he ne if he's going to maximize his value, that it will probably hamstring his team to do well otherwise. I mean, he might just start bidding more between these crappy teams. And I, that's why I'm I'm skeptical. I, I don't know why he'd go to the Browns. I don't, know, I don't think the Browns are that close, yeah, obviously. But to listen, the Browns have, you know, they've had a lot of good draft picks. Right. Now they got two first-round picks this yes. year. I mean, that might be the team that makes the turn. It doesn't seem that way because right. it's the Browns. Right. But maybe they're the team that's ready to make that move. Maybe. All maybe. right? Because you certainly see, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm still thinking fourth and 12. So, yeah. I mean, I, I can't get out of it. <laughs> but it, where does it go from Kirk Cousins with the new CBA that comes up, the new agreement, it's even going to get higher. You could have quarterbacks you know, making $40 million. And that's why there's some argument about Kirk Cousins taking a three-year deal with an opt-out for him. Yeah, it's it's going to be very crazy to see how that whole dynamic between the players' union and in like within the own players' union because the players want to leverage the NFL for more, and yet there's already a discrepancy between the top earners in the uh, among players. I mean, the, the discrepancy between a quarterback and a running back it's it's just insane. The fact that you're going to gain contracts of guaranteed ninety million dollars, and you know Alvin Kamara was making not even a million dollars last year. Basically, I mean th there are crucial players on teams who are making literal fractions of other players on their teams, and and it's hamstringing teams with the salary cap. I mean, like again, not to go back to Joe Flacco again, and that's a that's a contract signed four years ago, five years ago now. I mean, it's the the market is developing in a way. Well, that for a quarterback gonna, to make fifteen million, eighteen million, that's just average run in the mill now. Absolutely. All right. For for anyone who's a co a competent quarterback, that's about uh, their going price right now. My good buddy Pat McKinless just texted me. Former Towson star Kirk Lee. You remember him? You don't remember Kirk Lee? He was unbelievable. He taught, he helped take Towson to the tournament. I wasn't here at that time. All right. He was just. Well, it's Towson lore. You know, he was on the It is Towson lore. That's true. Former Towson star Kirk Lee's son is a starting point guard at Drexel. He played at St. Francis Very Academy. Nice. All right. So, uh, Pat always keeps me up to date on See, I, I think of, basketball. I think of uh, Towson legend Gary Neal. That, that, that's my Towson uh, legend. That's, the, Gary Neal was certainly a great player at Towson, but uh, Kirk Lee took him, to, took him to the promised land, as they say. Uh, okay. Where was I? Kirk Lee. Oh, Kirk Cousins. Wizards. Wizards. Okay. Wizards. Kirk, isn't that funny? Kirk Lee, Kirk, Kirk Cousins. Cousins. The Wizards. They showed me something on Thursday night. Not yeah. so sure about the Cavs anymore. I'm not so sure about oh, this come new. On, Bruce. It's Rebel. one game. No, first you're right. game out of the All Star break. You're right, except that the Wizards beat them without John Wall. And do you hear uh, Bradley Beal's Mia Culpa on TV? He was being interviewed. He said, how could anybody think that I would think we're a better team without John Wall? And, and that's a smart thing to say because no one is making He said, that. I made a comment. He said, I made a comment, but how could anybody think that we're better without John Wall? And that's generally the 
that's the word going around the league. It's just, but it is a conundrum. It's 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 an interesting little sample size that the Wizards have going on now. So you said that that it made you question the Cavs. I don't think it told me anything about the Cavs. It did tell me something about the Wizards, and it shows that they are having continued success without John Wall. Now it makes me think that while the team is no better without John Wall, when John Wall comes back, he's going to be the one that has to acquiesce. He's going to be the one that's going to have to somewhat adjust his playing style because obviously this team is really benefiting from more ball movement. And I remember a few years ago when, uh, it was probably two years ago now, it was after the Warriors' first uh, championship and Bradley Beal and John Wall were wanting to get out ahead and say that we are the, the best, best guard combo in the East and we could go up against any guard combo in the league. And if they are going to be like that, then they're going to have to take a page out of the Warriors playbook and get the ball movement going. I mean, people don't realize well, that, that. that's on the coach. Well, I think it's also on John Wall. Because, listen, I'm, I'm not saying that John Wall is a selfish player, but obviously his entire basketball career, and this is where it's going to be interesting to see if he can make the adjustment, he has been a ball dominant. He's running all over the floor, and if he can find a last-minute pass, he'll make it. But he wants to ISO. He's almost like Russell Westbrook. And they need, obviously, well, based that's on, on their But success. that's on Scott Brooks. And those Scott Brooks, okay. you have to distribute the ball. You have to pass the ball. You have to let everybody take the shot. Look, they got five guys who can hit threes. Yeah. Kelly Oubre can hit threes. Uh, Otto, Otto Porter. Porter's one yep. of the best. I mean, everybody but Gortat can hit threes. Absolutely. All right, the guys coming off the bench can hit threes. Mm -hmm. So they've got that kind of team. And, you know, he's got to spread the ball, and he can certainly handle the ball. There's no question about of it, course. John Wall. I don't, I don't know the answer. I really don't. But uh, that's Scotty Brooks. Is, uh, well, we're still about, I think, uh, three or four weeks away from his return. And it's gonna definitely going to be see, interesting to see when he gets back to practice if uh, they're going to you know, ease him back in into his uh, main ball dominant what about, role. What about these attacks that Stephen A. Smith have been, has been unleashing? Him and his old boy Skip Bayless are just relentless. Relentless. Well, on Stephen LeBron. A is is more relentless than anybody I on don't LeBron. Know, man, but yeah, he you're right. He does not stop. I mean, it's every word out of his mouth. He can't go here. He can't go there. He can't go to Houston. He can't go to L. A. He can't, you know, join the Golden State. He's going to ruin his image. He's going to do this. What, what, what did LeBron do to him? No, I have no idea. I have no idea. We, we have an ongoing joke here at 105.7 The Fan that uh, Jerry Coleman has has uh, crapped all over LeBron for 15 years because he snubbed him as a, as a high schooler for an interviewer. So, so, so I mean, like you, you never know what's the... Uh, the Jerry would never be that petty, uh, man. <laughs> never. Never. But the, uh, but the impetus behind that, I can't say. But... All I know is, and maybe this isn't a general unpopular opinion, LeBron should go wherever the hell he wants he's to go. He's entitled to. He's, he's a free agent. Now, granted, if he goes to the Warriors... You sound like Barkley. Okay. Uh, <laughs> obviously, if he goes to a team like the Warriors, his his legacy... I mean, he, he'll turn heel, just like Kevin Durant did. But I don't see... I would like to see him go to San Antonio, personally. I feel like that would be a really awesome landing spot for him, especially the way that Ka Kawhi Leonard seems to be forcing his way out of San Antonio. But, I mean, I don't think that he... The only way to remain respect like for LeBron to remain respectable is for him to stay in Cleveland I, I don't believe that he shouldn't be forced to stay in the east I mean and then yeah it, but you know what you know what the advantage of staying in the east is an easier trip to the finals it's exactly but, right but that's where he's in other words if you know you're going to be in the finals you're going to win some but what's his record in the finals three and five or something but he's listen he's there every year and every year he's there but that is where he's between a rock and a hard place with these critics because you either have people saying that oh he's just going to go to the west to go on to a super team or they're going to say oh he's just staying in the east because that'll make life easier for him to make it easier for him to go to the finals and that's what happened this week when he came out against the idea of the whole uh, playoff realignment and the and the reseeding across the entire league and I'm not sure what you think about that he said no and then all the LeBron haters came out and said well of course he says no because it's an easy trip for him to go to the finals if he stays in the east I, I really don't think there's anything I, uh, that dude can do to win what do you think about reseeding? I love it. 
I think it's great. I think it's great. Think about how much better the matchups will be. Well, how about the idea that they have this round robin tournament where they want to get two more teams in, so they have a single elimination tournament among the non playoff teams to incentivize not tanking and and get. I mean, there's a lot of really good ideas, and the fact that the NBA is progressive enough to even consider them is is very interesting. Look, what but, David Stern and Adam Silver have done with the NBA is incredible. It is incredible. Mine is choosing Fergie to sing the <laughs> national anthem. Have you ever oh, heard of the abomination? Goodness. Like that? Only Roseanne Barr. Only Roseanne Barr. Oh, my but goodness. But Roseanne Barr, it was done as a joke. Pretty tongue in cheek, you're right. I mean, she did. Maybe she made it. She shouldn't have done it. Right. All right. <laughs> but Fergie was doing this as if it was good. And I thought the funniest thing was the, with the looks on everybody's oh, face. Like Draymond. Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy, Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel <laughs> could not hold it in. All right. And Draymond, I mean, they were all looking at each other. And, and Steph Curry. Steph, yeah. I mean, they were being courteous, but... You know what? I'm almost... Like, we're a week uh, removed from it now. I'm glad that happened. I mean, like, like that made the entire night, like, a, that much better. I mean, the whole pregame was, was crazy. The whole Kevin Hart and Rob Riggle thing, that was a mess. But the game was fun. Uh, Wayne and Mason and I were talking about this on Sports Maven last week, and there was a lot of skepticism how entertaining would the game be. The game ended with LeBron James and Kevin Durant closing in on Steph Curry to close it out in a three-point game. That's all you have to say about Look, that game. Look, the last six or seven minutes of that game were spectacular. It was great. It was real hard-nosed basketball, three-point shooters against... And bead blocking at the end. It yeah, it, it was great, and uh, I give credit to LeBron. Yes. LeBron put everything of his heart into that game, trying to make it significant. Telling other people, let's, okay, let's play hard, let's play hard, let's do yeah, it. In other words, I give all credit to LeBron and Steph Curry uh, as the two captains, and uh, they're taking care of their business for the NBA, and they did a great job because it was watchable. And you're right, Kevin Hart, his introduction of Giannis was just, <laughs> I was in the car listening to it. I, he's he is something else. Yeah. He, he sold that to Civic Center or the Royal yeah, Farms he Arena. Did, but for we're, two we're, shows. Yeah, we're like, sponsoring it on on the fan. I mean, it's it's definitely interesting. I mean, with those introductions. I mean, he was he was kind of roasting the players as they were coming out. He was saying that Andre Drummond leads the league in in, in shoulder wax because he's because <laughs> he's a he's a hairy guy. I don't know. I mean, listen, I had a lot. It was of fun. great. And it I'm, was ha a lot and I'm happy fun. that the NBA is back. The I'm NBA is back for sure. Right? With that, we'll head out to our second break. This is Bruce Posner. Listening to Coons Ford S presents a sports maven. Coons Ford, wow, their lineup of SUVs is in incredible. Featured by the Echo Sport, the newest one, a car uh, SUV that similar to like the Rav Four, but. I've been in the car. It's as comfortable as it can be. Dennis tells me they have tremendous lease deals on it. If you're looking for an SUV and, say, the Escape or that style is a little bit too big, the Eco Sport is absolutely perfect for you. This is Bruce Posner. We'll be back in a minute here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. It's funny, I'm looking at the first Maryland-Michigan game, and uh, Bruno Fernando only played 18 minutes. And I wonder why, I can't remember now, he only had five points. Uh, Sikowski played 22 minutes, so I guess they kind of split it. Cowan had a big game that day, and... Maryland had that game won. They were up by 10 at halftime. Obviously, Michigan came back. Maryland had that game in the bag, all right? And then at the end, just as the season's gone, you know, they wound up losing. Let's get Todd Carton on the phone. Todd? Yes, sir. Good any, morning, Bruce. Any comments? I'm sure you listened to segment one with Wayne and myself. On, I, I sure did. Any comments? Well, you know, uh, I, it's funny because I, I said to Danny, I, sh I sure hope your, your trust in Mark Turgeon um, is well, well founded and well placed. But, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy who waits until, tries to wait until the facts come out. And I parsed his st statement very carefully. You know, he was very careful to say I had no relationship with uh, Miller or whatever the, the, the agent's name was. Didn't say we, didn't say anything about the, uh, his assistant coaches. And 
You know, I, I, I just think that there's, as Danny said, this is going to be the gift that keeps on giving for the next few weeks. Yeah, but you're over parsing it. I mean, I'm just going on the, the fact I know him, I've talked with him, and it just is not, he is, it's not in his nature. I'm just... I think I think Todd's point is is is, is just as valid though. I mean, I, I think your trust in him is fair, but I feel like it's, it's, oh no, then, then you're, listen, you're going out on a limb a little bit with it, right? I, well, I always go on the limb. All right, <laughs> I, I live on the limb, right, Todd? Yes, you do. All right, but that's just my opinion. And look, we got to wait to see how it flushes out. But uh, you'll tell by his demeanor a little bit today. I noticed that when. Uh, Izzo was under the heat of attack when he was at College Park. His demeanor was strange. All right, it was very strange. I don't expect that from Turgeon. I really don't. And let's. And isn't isn't Izzo a, one of the biggest question marks now with the with the abuse scandal that went on at Michigan State? And well, now the, you have this pot certainly on top of that. Certainly, the abuse scandal is is more relevant than Miles Bridges being taken out to eat by it. I mean. To me, to equate that into a crime by the NCAA, Jay Billis was just talking about it. We were watching. To equate that into a, a crime is ridiculous. And, you know, the, N, the NCAA markets itself for over a, a billion or two billion dollars for the tournament. Everybody markets themselves in the uh, college basketball except one group of gentlemen. That's the players. The ones who generate, who really generate all the money. They generate everything. I, I've you got know. problems with it. All right, real quick. First of all, men's lacrosse is off to four and start. Uh, Logan Wisnowskis from Boys Latin has really been the kid who shocked everybody, along with Bubba Fairman. He's kind of stepped right into the kind of like Colin Hecox shoes. And uh, this team's looking pretty good, but it's a long way to go. And I know you had to be, you called me about this kid, Shockey, won 11 out of uh, 17 faceoffs the other day. Right. Shockey, Shockey was, was great, but we'll see how, how, again, how the season goes. What I've liked most uh, about Maryland's lacrosse team, the men's lacrosse team in their four games is, you know, who do you, who do you guard? You know, you have Bubba Fairman has a hat trick in his first game, and then they, they focus on him, so Kelly and Bernhardt explode. Then they focus on Kelly and Bernhardt, and it's with Noskis. You know, it's just on and on and on, and there's so much balance, and the guys look so – willing to share the ball and move the ball and, and not really care who scores uh, and just get it, getting the best shot that I, I think that, that makes Maryland very dangerous. And I also thought, thought that uh, Bryce Young returning to the defense. Big factor. Uh, big big factor, factor. Against 10. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, listen, they're 4-0. They have a gauntlet of nine games that seem to be and they're not going to win all these games. You're, uh, Notre Dame, Albany, North Carolina, Pro, uh, Villanova on the road, and then the five conference games. There's just not going to happen. So there's going to be losses along the way. And what happens to the tournament, I'll take my chances with John Tillman any, any way, shape, or form. Olympic medals, you made a great point to me today that it seems like the USA is doing bad, but tell us what you told me. Okay, well, oh, I, I went back actually based on our conversation this morning. I actually went all the way back to 1980. And from 1980 through 88, the most total medals the, the U.S. team won was 13. Total medals. Generally around six gold medals. And 88 was really bad. They only won two. Then in 2002, which was in Vancouver, they bumped up to 20, or I'm sorry, no, 2002 was, I think, Tur Turin. They bumped up to 24. 2010 was the best year when they had, or 34, uh, no, 34 in Vancouver, 37 in Salt Lake City. The other years have been 25, 28. So it was what your, your point is, your point is, because we're it's out of time. About an average year. About an average year. It didn't seem like that to me. I guess I was so disappointed in Alpine skiing that uh, that affected me. Uh, Todd, do the Terps win today? Uh, I, the the men's basketball team because yes. I'm you know I got a women's lacrosse game on my mind. Oh, right, right, come on, men's Carolina. basketball. <laughs> men's basketball. I I think that Maryland does pull this game out. Today. I, I think that they're figuring it out, 
and at home against a team that they should have some confidence playing, I think Maryland does pull this. I agree with you, and I think the women will beat uh, North Carolina. We're out of time. Todd, thanks for coming on. This is Bruce Posner. Let's go Terps. Finish at 500, and we'll take things on next week in the Big Ten Tournament. See you Wednesday. Alcoons for Terp Talk.